Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for stopping by our daily lunch and learn here at Decisions. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes for a few other people to join, and then we'll go ahead and kick things off. If you do have any questions, you can go ahead and submit them, and we will get to them in order. All right, I think we have enough people to start kicking things off. Um, so we did have one pre-submitted question today. Um, I'm going to mess up your name. I apologize in advance. Is it is it Marielle? It's actually Murray. Murray? Yeah, yes. yeah. There's. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, you so, won't be the first or last. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. Um, so you submitted a question beforehand about if Decisions has any preferred vendors um, in the realm of OCR. Yes. Um, we do not. So our integration layer is robust enough that we seamlessly integrate with the majority of OCR vendors. Mm -hmm. um, so we've worked with several in the past, but there's no one that we would consider our preferred vendor. Um, do you have an example of a vendor you're considering and we can get back to you on previous experience with them? Um, not at the moment, but now that I know that's an option, I will definitely do that. Sure. You know, if, if you find something and it, it, it's something that you're interested in, if you want to shoot that over to us, we can let you know if, if it's something we've worked with before um, and if we had any issues or if it was just successful. Okay. Um, there's an agenda, addendum to my question. This is going to be for checks. And I don't know that that changes your answer at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no okay. it doesn't change my answer at the moment. Um, but I will, I will ask that around. I'll, I'll add that to the, the list I, or the question I put out there. Um, and if someone jumps back and says, actually, if you're working with checks, then this is what I recommend. Um, we will get back to you with that information. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. All right. So that was our last pre-submitted question. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and start going through the questions that have been offered up as the meeting kicks off. Um, so we have a question. Um, from Joshua Vogel. Let's see here. So last night he asked about removing the X in the upper right of a form. Um, and we were going to set the, the form title height to zero. Um, in six, it won't let you do it less than 16. It always resets to 72 pixels. All right. So I currently have a version seven open. Um, let's see. Let me go ahead and see if I have a version six available. Uh, Maurice, I see that you're on the call. I don't know. Do you happen to have a version six accessible uh, from your decisions computer? Uh, yeah, let me uh, get to it. If you don't mind terribly, it. yeah, if you don't mind sharing, that'd be super because I don't have access to a version six right now with where I'm working from. Yeah, I'm curious if it's a bug or if it's uh, something going on. Hold on. I, is screen sharing? Uh, yes, I can see your screen. Okay, cool. I can too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right, Leo Curtis. Yeah, um, we should have mouse control. Let's go ahead and see here. I always have to reorient myself to version six once we jump back.
Okay, and so we'll make this a pretty simple form here. Let's go ahead, we'll just make a simple button to so we can move on past the form as we route through it. And from here, go ahead, I wonder if, So they showed me that it was actually on the flow itself that you set the form title. Correct, right? yeah. So so by default, that's where you typically interact with the title. I was wondering if maybe, because mm -hmm. you can attach a CSS class here, and we could potentially, you know, hide it in that way. Right, um, okay. Let's go ahead. So, well, let's start with what they recommended. Let's validate that it's not working appropriately. And from there, we can take a look at something a little bit more intricate. Uh, let's see here. I tried that, that didn't. Yeah. So let's just go ahead. We'll see what we get here. Um, based off, if there's, so if there's not something there, it might just be something that we can submit a bug ticket for. Right. Um, beyond that, I think if it's, you know, something that you need a solution for immediately, we might have to find, you know, a CSS solution that allows you to hide that particular title bar. Yeah, um, okay. I can probably, yeah. But let's just kind of, while we're here, let's go ahead and validate uh, that we're still seeing this. We have, to, so we have to change in the flow, right? So I can change the title height of the flow. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So I nope. think the in easiest... the flow at, at the at the flow, but go go out to the flow to the folder level. Right? I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit on my end. What was that? Go go out go out to the folder level. Mm -hmm. and, that. and then wherever you stored that flow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Click on right. You know, click on that flow there, or right, or right click on it. Yes. Yeah. And then um, edit, I think, or manage. I think manage maybe. Yeah, manage set forms title style. This is what this is what the person last night showed. Right. Just set that to zero. So right. we can set this to zero, but they won't, they won't let it won't let you. So now, now there's an error if you hover, if you hover over it, so that, yeah. Yeah, the minimum supported height. Um, so. Yeah, this, the, yeah, of course, this is not going to hide the X, though. So oh, I do think okay. the easiest way to accomplish what you're looking to do is that we would just have to hide that element. Um, okay. That, that, that would be my recommended path forward. Okay, great. And, what, case. Okay, and what's the easiest way to determine what the element is? Sure. So, and let me, let me preface this by saying sometimes the elements do change before versions. So don't just copy and paste what we see here today. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead and make sure you actually do exactly what I'm going to do as you go through your process. So once you have something opened, right, you can simply come anywhere. And if we go to the right-hand side of our browser and we go to our additional tools, we should find yeah. our developer tools. Yep, yep, yep. And then from here, we can just inspect the element. Oh, okay. And then that, this is how you can get your, your class from okay, here. Okay, perfect. Uh, and just specify it accordingly. Okay, I'm going to try that. Thank you so much. Yeah, not a problem. So, Maurice, I will take back control if you want to stop sharing your screen, at least okay. <laughs> until we have our next version six question. All right. Should I put in a bug or just leave it be? What would you say? So, um, if you can give me your exact version of version six, I'll go ahead and okay. see if there's already been a bug submitted for it. Um, okay. And yeah, let's go ahead and get that resolved, uh, okay, regardless good. of whether or not the workaround does suffice. Okay. Yeah, I will uh, put that into the chat momentarily. Perfect. All right. So let me go ahead. I'll share my 
version 7 screen again. And let's move on to the next question. I did see another one pop up. So uh, we have a question here. If we can confirm whether or not there is no way to export a project created in version 7 to version 6. Um, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that, Josh. I'll take that. I'll copy down that note. So can you, what specifically was your issue when you were trying to, uh, you know, send something back a version of decisions? Because we, we've accomplished it before. Um, can you give us a specific example of an error that you encountered? Actually, I haven't tried it yet. I was just under the impression that since you cannot revert back to version six, that you would not be able to move things that were created in version seven back to version six. Sure. So um, I've, I've accomplished that in the past. Um, so if you do actually have an issue trying to do, we might move forward with it. Let's go ahead and get a support ticket submitted um, because you okay. should absolutely be able to um, maybe not migrate your entire platform back as you stated, but projects should be able to move between the environments. Okay. And will we get warnings or error? I mean, I know you so, don't know because you don't yeah. know what's in the project. You, you, will get, you will get warnings about mm -hmm. versioning. Right, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get a warning that says, you know, you are moving this back to, you know, version six, for example. Um, but it's, it's just in my experience, you know, and I've done projects before, so maybe there's some piece that you're utilizing that I haven't. Um, but I did get warnings, but they were just warnings, not hard stops. And the project was successful when I moved back into the new environment. Okay. Thank you. That's actually very helpful. Yeah, not an issue. No problem. Um, <laughs> I was surprised by your question. I was like, no, you should absolutely be able to do that. Um, okay. Um, so we don't have any other questions submitted at the moment. Um, and while there are no questions, um, I'll just kind of jump into a use case that I think is underutilized in decisions um, and just talk a little bit about it because I don't think it's functionality that a lot of people know exists yet, but I find it to be very helpful. Um, and of course, if a question arises, pre please feel free to go ahead and ask. Um, so one of the newest, you know, big fads in, in technology and, and workflow engines in general is the idea of introducing champion challenger models. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, a champion challenger model is just an easy way to assess the functionality of your current business processes and then compare them to a new idea. Right, so the ability to continue to add in continuous process improvement um, is, you know, the highlight. You know, it's, it's the new word of the day, for example, in technology. Um, and decisions does have out of the box functionality to implement some sort of champion challenger model to again allow you to have that continuous process improvement. So what I'm going to do, um, if everyone can see my screen. I'm going to go ahead and build just a quick example of what that looks like in decisions and some other plausible use cases for something like that. And again, this is just to show you guys something interesting while we wait for any questions to come up. So with that being said, what we're going to do is we're going to build a really quick, simple flow so that we can start talking about these concepts more in depth. So we'll go ahead, we'll create a new subflow. We'll call this our champion model. And we're going to keep this really simple. And we'll go ahead and we'll add in one more rule. So for both flows as well as rules, let's go ahead and make a quick rule. We'll call this R day of the week. <laughs> so this is a simple rule. If the day of the week is Thursday, we're going to go ahead and return a true value. So the idea behind a champion challenger model is there are, there are many use cases in business where you don't want to completely remove an acting process, but you do wonder if, you know, whether or not there is a change that you could make to your solution 
that would make your flow even better, your business process even more uh, appropriate for what you're trying to accomplish. And the best way to do that in decisions is again, through that champion challenger model. So for anything, whether it's a flow or a rule, you can go to your advanced settings. And instead of this selection type, instead of utilizing pick, you can go ahead and do a champion challenger model. And what this is going to allow you to do is essentially stack your subflows so that a certain percentage of the time, it's gonna to go to your champion model. And the other percentage of the time that you can control, it's gonna to go to your challenger model. And by default, decision is going to track the inputs and outputs of both of those subflows, as well as what, under what circumstances, which one was actually selected and utilized. So that from there, you can start to build out, you know, your process metrics to determine, you know, which process is actually the best for you. So that sounds great. That sounds useful. Let's go ahead and actually look at a, you know, a real life scenario when we went ahead and used something like this. So if we jump into a previously built flow, um, we had clients that were exploring how to use decisions as a mining agent, right? How to use decisions so that you could get a, you know, a bird's eye view of a process and then delve into potential, you know, solutions for a better working flow. And a great example was that is that we had a client and they had a very linear workflow, right? It would go, for example, from person A, then straight to uh, person B, which was a, another level up, and then finally to a manager, right? And the manager would be the final approval. Now, every single person in their working group could function as person A, right? So it was an assignment sent to a large group of people. Everyone in group B, um, it was a much smaller subsection of people. Um, and they were doing their routing based off of a rule set, right? So it was analogous to what we're looking at here, where based off of some parameters, it would then route to the personnel that matched those parameters. Um, and we'll utilize, we can just use these names, for example. So policy admin instead of person A and underwriter instead of person B. Now, in their case, their underwriter position was understaffed, right? And a particular example, a parameter would always be routed to just a single person. And so there was, at the end of the day, when they were looking at the metrics, right, there appeared to be a bottleneck in their business. And because of that bottleneck, they wanted to say, okay, well, can we fix this bottleneck by either changing our workflow or maybe just increasing the amount of underwriters available? And sure enough, when they went, they, they accomplished that test, right, that, that simple kind of business process test by utilizing a champion challenger model. So they came in here, they introduced a champion challenger model, and on their secondary approver table, they actually just added in a ton of people to that secondary stage. And from that secondary stage, again, as they started routing a, you know, a smaller portion of their request through that process, um, they collected metrics on it. And at the end of the day, you know, I think they did this for like 60 days, I think was the use case. Um, after, you know, after more or less two months, um, they were able to look at the data and make a metric and, you know, a data-driven metric informed decision um, that the solution they came up with was in fact correct. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a tagline, but the way, I, the way I talk about it now is that, you know, utilizing something like a champion challenger model um, allows you to transform a gut feeling, right? Like I think this would make our business process better to transform that gut feeling into you know, a, an objective data-based decision. Um, and I think most people, even the people I talk to at Decisions don't necessarily know about this functionality. And I think there's a lot of uh, great use cases that people can uh, use this for. So uh, quick side example, um, I don't see any questions uh, that have been posted still. Um, so with that being said, does anyone have any questions about what we just saw from a champion challenger perspective? And it's okay if you don't. Okay, so it doesn't seem like I think everyone here has been sold on the value then of the championship or champion challenger model. 
and it will be something that will be integrated, I'm sure, in the future on projects. Um, so even if it's not particularly a question, is there a functionality? I'm currently in version seven. Or go ahead, Josh. Yeah, um, totally different. Not related to this. I'm sorry, but this is this is pretty cool. Um, is there a way to convert like a string to a dynamic data row? This is I'm just trying to figure out right now. I figured if you're on the line, I can ask quickly. So to a dynamic data row specifically, or I mean, could it just be a, like a user type that you've defined? Oh, specifically because the I'm, I, I'm, I'm building a drop down from uh, a dynamic data row and sure. I'm trying to set, I give that as input as well so I could have it as pre-selected. That's, that's sort of what I'm trying to Sure. So to do. I believe that if you were to come in here to your types and you go here and you actually search for your dynamic data row, yeah. You should have it here as a dynamic data row. Yeah. And then from here, you know, go ahead here. We can save and close this. Perfect. We could expose properties, change value. All right. So let's go ahead and see. Let's just go make a quick example where we go ahead and build this out. So as an input to our flow, we'll have some string value. Is it uh, repeating content or not? Uh, no. I'm sorry, just, is it a list no. or just a simple string? Uh, I'm, I, it's just a single, I, by the time it gets here, it's a simple string. I, I'm Perfect. breaking down a list into strings and then. see here so if I do a select from flow is there any reason so a string is going to give us a complaint about the type what if I just build my data so by default dynamic data row is coming from that file data right because that's the decisions like if you ask it to you know parse an excel file or something like that that is the yeah. output um, so to answer your question briefly um, no it, it's going to expect this to come from some sort of file data uh -huh. um, that being because said, if you yeah. have a string value, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm curious what the use case is, is the why you need to populate your um, particular uh, drop down menu, I believe you said, um, with a dynamic data row. Is there not the ability so it's, to? It's, quer it's querying a database to get the values. Mm -hmm. So I, so I, I display, I display a name. Sure. Or let's say a pharmacy, but I'm also, but I store the ID, but in order to, when I reload the form, I want it to be able to, so the query comes back as a dynamic data row, mm -hmm. um, I believe. And then, um, then I, I'm to load it again when I want to, you know, reload the, the form to make a change or whatever. Right. Uh, I want to be able to show the, the, the word value, you know, the actual name versus the uh, exactly. The so ID. let me let me ask you this. So you said you're querying a database, right? I know that yeah. by default the output is going to be data rows. Are you using the raw SQL step, or how are you querying yes. that database? I I believe I'm using the raw SQL step. Yes. So in my yeah, I'm, I ha I kind of have to just because that that's the easiest way to accommodate sure. all the different environments we're working in. So, so um, I do know, so for example, uh, we'll just do something real simple here. Uh, let's go ahead and let's, let's make let's build out a little bit. So I, I've done your use case before um, yes. and there's a little bit, so yes, you can use data rows, but you should be able to break down the data row um, into that string component you're looking for. Um, and so what you can do is uh, your data rows that come back, right? They're probably going to be like a CSV, more or less, the array that's yeah, returned yeah, by yeah. decision. I, I mean, I, right, I know which field is which one. So it gives me a field one, two, three, four, five. So I tell mm -hmm. it to display field three, and I pull in from the form, I feel, pull in field one, so to speak. Perfect. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think we can make a pretty clean use case for you here. And <laughs> since we don't have any other questions, let's go ahead and just build this out. We'll just do it now. 
Okay. So let's take a look at our query editor. Let's go find a good example of something that we can use. Let's see. Let's go ahead and find a good data type that we know will be populated. All right, so we're going to do our instrument policy application. Sure. And perfect. So let's just go ahead and we'll just grab this entire thing, right? Because you can see that the return, um, even from a data row perspective, right, is going to be quite intensive. So we'll just utilize this as our SQL command. We're going to say that we're going to return data rows. And let's go ahead. We'll go ahead and add a form. I think I spend most of my time when I'm developing decisions, making sure these arrows are <laughs> lined up in a way that makes me happy. We'll jump into our form. Okay, so from here, the type that you're sending into your drop down, um, I know that you want to populate it with data rows. Is there any is there any reason that the type can't be string and that we could use a component of the data row? As long as I can still save the ID that that gets pulled in as well. So like I don't want to I don't want to because like, I. I I want to show the name, but I didn't want to pull in the ID because when I use that. Got uh, you. Okay. Right. So, that's, so that's sort of why I was leaning towards using the dynamic data row because I, I'm able to pull, you know, send, I set, basically I send the whole row as or part of the form. I just save the, the value that I need. Um, is that making sense? I believe so. I'm going to open up the form myself here so I can click around and show you exactly what I, so I tell you exactly what I have. It's a very complex form. All right. So we should have our form here. And let's go ahead and I select the values for the drop down from a query, from a flow in the form, not a flow outside the outside the outside the flow outside the form but i don't think that probably doesn't make it yeah so this this would return all of our ids and then the selected row that you pick all of the information will be preserved for that row uh, as you go downstream in the flow so if i were to say you know this worked i look at my output of the form you can see that the output that we've sent in is in fact the entirety of that data row and that's when using a string is that is that that's it Sorry, I missed that whole. Yeah, no problem. So if we actually go back into the form, I did just utilize the drop the dynamic data row. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and click on it. Yeah, so we utilized a dynamic data row as the type. We selected the field that we wanted to display. Um, and then that selected value is going to be that dynamic data row um, with right. all the values attached to it. Right. So now, so now, but now when I reload the form, I want to be able to have the, the, the drop down show what was already selected. That's, and that's why I need the dynamic data row. The straight, right? So I, I take all the, so let's say I have three drop downs. What I do is I have three drop, maybe I'm building the form wrong. I have three drop downs and um, I, I combine the results of those three into, uh, you know, a, a, 
a, a list or a string, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. Uh, and then uh, and then I save that to the entity that saves at the end of the form. And then when I want to reload that entity and edit the, edit it with the form, I want to be able to show based off of the IDs that I save. Um, I still want, I want to show the, the name of the pharmacy that they're choosing, so to speak, as opposed to the ID. So that's okay. Sort of where that, that's so that that's the, the second half where I want to re redisplay it based off of the off of the IDs that I have. And then, so I have a flow preceding the form right now that takes all of the um, you know, takes the IDs and you know sure. runs a query against them to get the uh, get the name. Of it, so I thought that's what I need to do, but maybe I just need to fetch the whole row. Maybe now I'm thinking if I fetch the whole row. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the way that the I would ID. accomplish it. Is I would okay. once you have that ID, I would go actually fetch the entire row. So if we jump back uh -huh. here, and then um, so just pass. I got you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Now, so now I talk it out, and like now it all comes clear. Okay. So if I so if I, if I pass in the row into the into the input, then I. Then I'll get the the row that I want displayed on the on the form when it reloads. Precisely. Yep. Okay. Okay. I got you. Okay. Uh, fine. I'm going to try that. Fantastic. I like so, to hear that. Yeah, I think I think that'll yeah, work yeah. out for you. No, and if I'll, it doesn't, I'll, you know, we do this every day, right? So you can come right, back. I'll come and back. We'll, we'll, I'll be we'll back evaluate. on Monday. Don't worry. <laughs> exactly. I'll be back on Monday. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah. Not an issue. Okay. Um. Okay, so we've talked about champion challenger models. We've solved a few questions. Um, unfortunately, if there are no other questions, uh, I'm gonna turn into a pumpkin and we're gonna have to uh, just come back next time. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to see in decisions today? Okay, Sabrina, I think everyone, um, <laughs> I think all the questions have been answered and they really just need some time to go ahead and think in the future about how to use that champion challenger model to make their business better. Um, is there anything you wanna close the loop on Sabrina before we let everyone go? Nope, I think you did everything just fine. I think we're good. All right, well, thanks again, everyone for attending. If you do have any follow-up questions, uh, you know, we'll be here next week. And uh, Joshua, I will go ahead. I'll give that uh, version number to our support team yeah. and see if it's an existing error. All right. Until next time, everybody. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks, Curtis.